Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for the opening meeting of the Northeast Area Elementary Boundary Study. Uh, I'm Chris Percato with the Office of Strategic Planning and here to open with a few housekeeping tips, some safety tips uh, for everybody. Um, first of all, please make sure you uh, hit the sign-in sheet up front, all our uh, committee members tonight. Um, in the event of an emergency, a fire alarm sounding or anything like that, we have exits here to the side. Uh, we'll join out in the parking lot and check the sign-in sheet to make sure that we have everyone. Uh, let's see, next up is restrooms. Restrooms are out the doors to the rear and to the left. Please don't go into other areas of the building. Uh, we have uh, BCPS TV is here with us tonight. Uh, they are going to be running their cameras and microphones to capture this meeting for all our observers at home who are not able to attend in person. Um, so we do ask that if, uh, if you are speaking, please make sure you're up at a mic or raise your hand to, a, you know, to make us aware so that you can approach a mic because we want to make sure that we capture all your audio clearly. Um, and due to COVID restrictions, just a reminder of some uh, COVID restrictions, um, this meeting is being attended in person only by our committee members. All others are welcome to attend the meeting virtually, and we certainly hope that you all do so. Our boundary study website on the bcps.org page has, all the has access to all the meeting materials, the links to attend the meeting, and will be the uh, central archive for all the meeting materials as the committee's work progresses. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be serving no food here tonight. There is bottled water at your table. Um, we will be wearing masks at all times, and we will all be uh, keeping aware of a six-foot social distancing. There will be a few small group committee activities uh, that will be involve us getting a little bit closer, but their time limits will be restricted to about 10 minutes. Um, and finally, if uh, should if throughout the course of this meeting set, should you find yourself um, in a position of having a positive COVID test, or if you are, have been exposed to someone who has been COVID positive, uh, there are instructions in your book to go over to contact Mike Godfrey Center in our Office of Strategic Planning to forward that information. Thank you all very much, and over to Mr. George Roberts for uh, introduction. Thank you, George. Absolutely. Thank you, and good evening, everybody. I just want to move this up a little bit so I don't have to bend over. First, on behalf of Dr. Williams and our Board of Education, we want to welcome all of you and definitely thank all of you for your time, um, not just this evening, but over this process. Um, we know everyone in this room, your time is precious. Um, we know that there are many other things, um, especially for our volunteer, for our parents and our teachers who, who uh, agreed to participate in this. Um, certainly you're giving up parts of your evening and parts of your personal life to join us this evening for an incredibly um, and important process of our new Northeast Elementary School boundary process, which includes all the schools that you see listed here. So you know, this process is controlled and we move through and controlled by policy and rule. So if at any time, and you, that may even be in your binder, questions about the policy and the rule that govern our boundary process. We are fortunate here in Baltimore County where our school boundary process is an extremely public and extremely transparent process where we welcome community input, we ask for community input almost at every phase of the process. And certainly as was mentioned before, this is live stream and it's recorded so the public can view this at any time at their leisure so they can see how the proceedings go. So when it does come time for formal public input that they can go back and see any questions, the discussions, the things that you're gonna be wrestling with and having input on um, for the benefit of all the schools that are involved in this boundary process. Certainly wanna thank our principals who are here who are taking time out of their evening and leading their respective school groups um, and knowing that they have a very critical process though they don't vote ultimately in the process. Mr. Cropper is gonna go over with you all of the do's and don'ts in the entire process, but our principals are critical in answering a lot of key questions, questions that you may have or that the community may submit, not just for their school, but for the entire process. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't thank um, our host principal, Shannon Parker. Um, though she's not here, we wanna thank her and her team for allowing us to use this space. We have used this space before for other boundary processes and it has been 
a wonderful space for the community to use. If you are not already an expert map reader, I promise you, you will be an expert map reader. All of these maps will mean something to you over the next few weeks and few months. Um, so certainly um, an exciting process and one that we are definitely thankful, I mean grateful for all of you to participate in. So again, thank you for joining us. Um, myself, my team, Dr. Mullenix in the back in the blue, and Mr. Eric Wilson, our two executive directors, they work with these schools um, on a day-to-day -day basis, and we work together to support the principals and the children of these schools. And lastly, Mr. Kevin Jennings, who's sitting there, um, Mr. Jennings is opening and, and was selected and appointed to um, open the new Northeast Elementary School. So he will be here as an observer as well, um, because obviously the fruit of your work is going to be obviously directly impacting Mr. Jennings in opening our brand new Northeast Elementary School, but then also the shift potentially um, with children moving amongst the schools here. So with that, again, thank you. And I will turn it over to Mr. I believe Mr. Cropper who's our veteran uh, facilitator in this process, and you are gonna be in wonderful hands with Mr. Cropper over these next few months. So Matt, it's all yours. Thank you, Mr. Roberts. And uh, thank you all for coming and participating in this process. Uh, we can't stress how important it is to have you guys be involved in this process and give us input and really drive towards a recommendation. Uh, before we get started into the, into the meeting, I uh, just wanted to make sure everybody has a binder You'll have this binder here, and please bring this with you to the meetings because you'll see there's tabs in here. And at every meeting, we're going to be giving more information to go into the binder. So um, and the, uh, the meeting materials for tonight are also included in this binder. So this is something that you'll use as a reference. And then you'll also notice we have maps uh, scattered about. You guys are, uh, tonight, you're going to be working in three groups. And so there's a map for each set for each group. So there's one set here and a duplicate set there and a duplicate set here so that, that we can spread out and get some small group work done. Um, before we get into the agenda though, I just wanna do a little introduction, uh, some introductions. And um, I am Matthew Cropper with Cropper GIS Consulting. Also James Cooper from our office is here. And we're here to help you guys uh, facilitate this process. Uh, but I wanted to, and we don't wanna have everybody um, say their names to that tonight just because of with COVID and things like that. We want to kind of keep people closer to uh, where they're sitting. But what we'd like to do is I'm just going to go through the schools that are participating in this process. And when I call the name of the school, if we could have everybody who's affiliated with that school just raise their hand. So then we can all kind of get a feel for who's, who's around the table and, and the people, what schools are affiliated with. So if we could, um, everybody who's affiliated with Elmwood Elementary, Please raise your hand. Okay, so we've got some Elmwood folks here. And how about Fullerton? Fullerton Elementary. Okay. Uh, Joppa View Elementary School. Okay, some Joppa View folks. Uh, McCormick Elementary. Okay, welcome. Uh, Perry Hall Elementary. Okay. And Red House Run, thank you. And then Shady Spring Elementary, okay. And how about Vincent Farm? Okay, we've got some Vincent Farms. Vincent Farm, I got criticized last time for saying Vincent Farms, and it took me about four months to get it out of my head, but I promise I'll do my best. Um, and then, so then, so, so as you can see, we have, uh, representatives from all the schools that would be impacted in this process. But also, in addition to that, we have a lot of supports here. A lot of people from different offices, from the, from the district and such. And so we do have some people from strategic planning here. If you could just raise your hand. So strategic planning, we have uh, strategic planning staff here. And then, um, and then we have basically a lot, I think Mr. Roberts gave a good introduction of some of the other support staff but we have, we have uh, staff from all different uh, departments. Special education, okay, and then how about communications and community outreach? Does anybody hear from that? And uh, equity and cultural proficiency, okay, thank you. And how about early childhood? And school safety? Okay, so 
the, you'll see representatives from these different offices coming in and attending and participating in these meetings. If they're not here at a particular meeting, we will certainly reach out to them and use them as a resource. We have the staff here to really help support us and ask questions that we may not understand or may not know that are outside of our knowledge as we work through this process. So tonight, you can see we have an agenda that goes to 8 o'clock tonight, um, but we won't keep you here any longer than we have to. But um, we're basically going to review the process and timeline, go over the, the, over the objectives and our timeline and why we're doing this and why there's a need to do this. We have a background report that is included in your, in your packet here. And also the PowerPoint presentation is also in your, your binder as well, if you wanted to refer to that in the future. Uh, and we're going to do a couple of exercises. We have a, 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 an opportunities analysis exercise, and we're going to talk about planning blocks, which is something that, that you're going to get used to. And so we do have a, a good amount of stuff to cover tonight, and we're going to dive right in. So really the goals for tonight's meeting is to uh, familiarize you with the background report, some of the background materials that we're just kicking things off with. We don't have any maps, per se, of options, no boundary change maps that are being presented tonight. We're going to get into that next week. That's going to be the second meeting. We're going to start looking at draft options. Tonight's just looking at some of the foundation materials that you're going to be using as reference guides for the work that you're doing. We're going to establish and begin practicing norms for committee engagement and then talk about the planning blocks because those are kind of the building blocks for boundary changes. And I'll talk about that here in a minute and we're going to give you guys an opportunity to look at those and give us some initial feedback. So this is a boundary change study. It's guided by policy in Rule 1280, which are established by the administration and the school board. Uh, this process is facilitated by an independent consultant, which is us, Cropper GIS Consulting. Um, we've been working with the district for uh, about, I think about 15 years, we've done different boundary study processes across the county over the years. But we also work with school districts all over the United States and uh, have worked with districts of over 3,000 students all the way up to 300,000. So we've done a lot of work of districts of all sizes and br bring that perspective here. And this process is driven by a community committee. So you guys are really driving this process and helping to provide a recommendation that we will deliver to the school board. And you're made up of principals, parents, teachers, and community members. And we're really looking at this to be an objective process. So when you start moving boundaries around, you know it starts to get emotional. People start thinking uh, that, you know, that the, the, you start, your child may be impacted and moved in one option or another. You really start, starts to pull on, tug on the heartstrings. So you have to, the, the best way to do this is to stay focused on data and be able to make objective decisions and objective uh, recommendations and try to keep e the emotional component of this set aside as much as possible. We know and we're compassionate about the emotion, and, uh, and I've been there. I have children who have been th th involved in all of this too, so I know how it feels, but we do uh, plead to you to, to maintain objectivity, take off the parent hat when you come to this meetings, and put on the committee member hat. Even if it could, may affect your child or your household, we have to focus on what's best for all children in this area as we work towards a recommendation. Uh, I've talked about us, Cropper GIS Consulting. Uh, this is the kind of work that we do on a daily basis and uh, honored to be working with you guys on this study. Um, so let's talk a little about the committee. You guys are all here as the committee. We have 33 members, um, but 25 of those are voting members. The uh, principals are non-voting members of the committee, but they're here to help inform and even provide input as we work through boundary options, but they are not, uh, they're not voting members. Eight teacher and staff representatives are here, and then 16 parents. We have two parents from each school around the table here. And then one area educational advisory council representative. Is that, is that representative here, the area educational advisory? Okay, yes. Thank you. I didn't get to get you to raise your hand, so thank you for that. Um, but like I said, you're suspending your parochial interest here in this, taking off that parent hat, and putting on the committee hat, focusing on what's best for all children, even if it may impact you. Um, and we're asking you to attend all meetings that you can, if at all possible. And we're meeting seven times between now and December. 
And um, the public is, observe, is able to observe, so this is being live streamed and also uh, recorded, so the public is able to, to uh, watch and, and, uh, and, and observe these meetings. And ultimately, the committee will be presenting a recommendation to the Board of Education via the community superintendent. So typically, the community superintendent and myself present your recommendation to the board, and we certainly welcome you to, uh, to be there present, and we would acknowledge you uh, in, in all of the hard work that you're about to get into here. Here is our calendar, and this is included in the, in the, in the binder, but you can see we've got six meetings. Uh, the green ones are the meetings that we have where we'll be working through options development and, and just basically trying to develop the different scenarios. We have a public information session here that you could see that's in November. Really these first four meetings, the focus of these first four meetings is to see how many different scenarios can we create? How many viable scenarios do we, can we develop uh, that we can share with the public? And when we get to meeting two and meeting, meeting three, we'll start, meeting three and meeting four I should say, is where we start to narrow down to bring us a good number of, of options to the public. And you guys can decide which ones we want to take to the public, but typically it's around two or three options is what we usually take to the public. And then we'll be doing two more meetings after that public info session to finalize your thoughts and then uh, finalize a recommendation for the board. And we will be presenting to the board that recommendation is presented in February of next year. And the board is expected that they'll have a series of hearings where they'll invite the public to come express their thoughts about the recommendation and that's expected to happen in, in February as well. And then the board decision will happen in March of next year. So we've got a lot of time, a lot of ground to cover, but, uh, but, but we have it built and, and done this a lot to, to make sure it's an efficient and effective process. So let's talk about this area. Uh, we, we were here just a few years ago working on um, uh, the Victory Villa School and all the, some of the surrounding schools. But uh, the district is still in the midst of, of improving schools and uh, to, to, to support the increasing enrollment and, ca and capacity constraints in the district. Uh, four elementary school projects in this northeast region. So in, um, in spring of 2021, the superintendent initiated a boundaries change project to, um, to help account for some schools that are being constructed and, or rebuilt in this area. Um, there is a new elementary school in the northeast at Rossville Boulevard and Gum Spring Road, and that's opening in 2022 and 23, 2022, the fall of, of that year. And that's gonna have 709 seats. Um, in addition to that, Red House Run Elementary is being rebuilt for 775 seats. It currently has 460 seat capacity. So they're adding a lot of capacity in this area, but when you start looking at the numbers, you'll understand why and that the schools are all operating very uh, over 100%, uh, most of them are. And so there's a need for the capacity to help provide the capacity relief to the schools that have the greatest need, as well as trying to balance utilization across the whole study area. So as it, sees, as it shows here, there's four schools that are exceeding 115% of their capacity. And so there certainly is an evident need to do uh, the work that you guys are doing in so building new schools, we have, we're tasked to build zones around the schools and then also to help figure out how to relieve the other schools while we're doing that. Participating schools here, you can see this, this, the study area map is, is fairly large, but, uh, but we have, uh, we have um, all the schools involved here that, that are anticipated that could be impacted. So we will certainly try to minimize the number of students that are moved in providing a recommendation and working through this. But um, we should acknowledge that any student in this study area could be impacted. And, uh, but you know, we're not gonna move students just for the sake of moving them, but we have to know that no, no student's off the, off the table. And so we have to uh, be, be open-minded and provide, an op, provide a recommendation knowing that any child could be impacted in this study area. Um, to note, I mentioned we were here a few years ago for Victory Villa uh, in fall of 2018. And so there were many schools that are around the table here were also involved in that process back then. So as we work through the boundary change process for this study area, 
we'll be mindful of those schools that, and communities that were moved in 2018, trying to not move students again that were moved just recently when the last re re, uh, boundary change process. So that's something that we're aware of. We know all the communities that, that were impacted the last process, and we'll be really be careful about moving them again, if at all, if at all possible, not moving them again. And those are, you can see they're highlighted here in the orange, Joppa View, Perry Hall, Shady Spring, and Vincent Farm. So not to say we won't impact those schools, but just the areas that were moved last time may not, we're trying not to move that same student or same household again, if at all possible. So uh, the community-based comprehensive study is tasked to meet the following key objectives, reduce overcrowding in the region. When we have that opportunity with the new capacity that's coming online, Create viable and successful boundaries to utilize this, the, the new capacity that, we are, uh, that, that is being added to this area. And then support diversity among schools that reflect the community and the school system. So we'd have, we have a lot of statistics and data. In addition to the number of students in the buildings, we're also going to be looking at demographics of the schools and other components of students that can walk to school and a lot of different factors. And we'll be looking at all of those and trying to, to uh, address them and be knowledgeable of the different statistical data as we continue to work through options. We're not just looking at capacity, there's other statistics that we'll be looking at to try to, to, try to meet the, the objectives that we're tasked with. Primary considerations, first the things to follow, this is rule 1280 and these are basically the rules that are established in, in board policy. And uh, primary consider considerations are efficient use of capacity in effective schools. So capacity is certainly the the, the, the overarching goal here and provide that relief. And maintaining or increasing the diversity among schools and um, to reflect the diversity of the region and the school system. Uh, we want to look at, as I said, those demogra the demographic data. We want to uh, maintain the demographics of schools and if there's any opportunity while we're addressing capacity to, um, to make the schools more demographically diverse to, uh, to, to mirror that of the community in the area and we have that opportunity that's something that we will certainly look at but we have to look at all these factors as a whole as we work to build um, options secondary considerations and these are things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis when we w do boundary change processes across the country and this is what the the, uh, the district also uses is to maintain the continuity of neighborhoods so try not to draw the line down the middle of a residential neighborhood we want to try, if we have to draw the line, try to use more major roads so that a community, if a community moves, that community moves together. We don't want to draw the line down residential streets, you know, thinking of children who have friends and, and across the street. We want to try to maintain those social bonds that they're making when they're outside of school and keep communities together, if at all possible. Um, the impact of transportation and pedestrian patterns on students. So looking at there's a lot of walkable areas here in this in certain in certain parts of this district uh, this study area a lot of students walking so we want to try to provide that continue to maintain that walkable opportunity for as many students as possible and then be mindful of what we're doing with transportation as we continue to work through options minimize the number of times any individual students are reassigned and that that ties into what I was talking about with the victory villa process uh, the many times it, that doesn't it's not doesn't come in play but in this particular process it certainly is something to, to be mindful of that we have to to, to be be aware of looking at long-term enrollment capacity trends and future capital plans so we will also be providing uh projected enrollment information and things like that so that you can also be mindful of what the projections are looking like and um and future capital plans and those types of things to be just to have uh, knowledge of as we work through our process. Location of feeder school boundaries and continuity of feeder patterns. So we, we do uh, have information uh, and we'll be providing the uh, boundary information for middle and high schools but the focus of this process is elementary schools. We're not, we're, this committee is not tasked with providing any recommended change to a middle or high school boundary but as you, as you move an elementary area one way it may uh, impact where they go to middle school. But we'll, we're going to be tracking that and looking at that so we're mindful of how middle school, that elementary and middle school progression may be impacted. 
And then phasing in boundary changes by grade level for high schools, that doesn't apply here because our focus is only uh, on elementary schools. Additional things to consider are the use of geographic features, railroads, uh, major roads, highways, those kind of things that kind of uh, help identify, uh, you know, communities and also avoiding students from having to walk across those types of areas. If you draw the lines along those major roads, it usually helps to, to, to enable that and, and, and prevent students from having to make just additional, um, additional risks, even though the district does a good job of, of ensuring the safety of students and as they transport students. Um, elimination of existing satellite boundaries. So this is something that does exist in this study area. And we have it highlighted on the map here, but you could see the bottom left corner of our study area. You'll see the, uh, some green and pink down here. And these are what we call satellite areas. So the, 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 the purple area actually feeds into Elmwood, and then the green areas feed into McCormick. And Red House Run is down here. So this is something that, um, that typically we get asked to help resolve when we come in and help with boundary change studies. And this is something that we will be asking you to look at as well as we, as we work to provide a solution. Try to resolve and eliminate these satellite areas because they, if you remember the rule 1280, the different components of the rules that I was talking about, the satellite areas kind of bring you a little bit further away from adhering to those rules. Transportation efficiency, walkability, um, all those components and things like that are things that, that, we, that, that we'll focus on that will ultimately end up in, uh, in having these satellite areas go away, if, if at all possible. So assuring equity and accessibility, uh, we want to make sure that everybody has the opportunity to participate and provide input across the county or across the study area. Uh, we do have translation uh, 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 available and materials can be translated upon request. And so this is not only for you guys, but also for those who are watching online or watching a recording of this. And video recordings of the meetings can, uh, are converted to YouTube, and YouTube has a very good uh, closed, caption, uh, closed captioning uh, feature where you can look at different, you can toggle to a different language. So that's going to provide an additional opportunity for people who may not have English as their primary language. Um, we do have translators available at the public information session upon request. And so we, we, we have had translators at prior processes, and that's something that we will certainly enable. And then um, there's an online survey that, that accompanies when we get to the public information process that those materials will be translated to multiple language as w languages as well. Uh, we ask that all committee business and decisions are conducted at these committee meetings. So we, we ask that you don't get together with a small subset of, of, of committee members and work through maps and things like that, it's best to have the work of the committee done at the committee meeting so that the public can benefit from the, from the work that you guys are doing. And if there is inclement weather, weather if uh, schools are closed, then these meetings unfortunately would be canceled. Uh, and so we do have snow days posted on our timeline for if in the event of inclement weather. weather. Uh, we do, uh, in, in the whole sense of enabling transparency and, and maybe making sure the public follows the process and that there is no, nothing um, that is unknown, there's a boundary uh, study uh, webpage that's located at bcps.org. So all the materials that we share with you guys on a meeting to meeting basis are all gonna be posted online. And those materials are online now, I believe, is that right? Those, those materials are all posted online now and so any member of the public can go online to, uh, to access the Northeast Elementary Boundary Study materials. There's also a comment form that's online. And this is for you guys, in your information, as you go to share things with your school communities and your neighbors and things like that. Um, they can go download all the materials and print off all the materials that you guys are using. There's also a comment form that's on there that anybody who has any comments at any time can provide their input on that comment form and that information will be tracked and we will share that information back with you guys as well. Uh, if you want to email, you can email the board or committee at boundarystudy at bcps.org if you prefer not to use the comment form. Um, 
And, and then um, the public can observe these meetings via live stream so that we enable them to be able to watch and, uh, and give us and see what's going on here. And then the public information session, because of, the, because of COVID, we uh, are doing the public information session virtually. And we have, uh, our company has done virtual public information sessions over the last year and a half. And they've been very successful. And so um, it's, a good, it's still a good method to reach out to the public and get some input. And they'll be able to watch and, and learn about the options that you guys are sharing at that time. Um, and then, like I said, there'll be a survey that'll be posted along to accompany the public info session where um, we'll ask, ask for additional input related to the options. And then the public can also attend the Board of Education public hearing in February. So there's many, many opportunities for, uh, for public engagement and public input beyond, what we, with, beyond our public uh, community-based committee here. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the background report. Uh, background report is in your, uh, you'll see it in your meeting one materials in your binder. Um, the, what we, we call it a background report, it's basically the, some of the initial beginning data and statistics that we have put together to help further inform you about, um, about the process. The, 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 real, the, the power of the background report is that it enables you to look and ref, refer to data and statistics and not speculate. If somebody says, well, how big is, uh, how many students are, how many, what's the capacity of this school? You can go to the background report and you can find the number instead of, have, instead of speculating or guessing. It's really important to, to, uh, to, to refer to the background report if you, there are any data or information that you wanna share and also uh, share it with the public so that everybody has a message that's consistent and accurate. Everybody's looking at the same information and that we're not, we're, not look, we're not having different numbers floating around here and there. Um, we ask you to be familiar with the entire report, but uh, there's those considerations I went over are on page one. Our timeline is on page four, so that that's, shows you sort of the rough agenda and the timeline for meetings. We've got uh, a school facility table, and we have some uh, enrollment tables that are located in pages nine and 22 of the background report. And then we have a whole series of maps that are included as well, uh, maps of each school. So talking about the maps a little bit, uh, everybody, uh, most people are familiar with maps and un understanding how to interpret maps. We, I like to say maps are the, a common language across, across all uh, communities. And so the, the maps really help provide you information um, and you'll see maps for every school, and, and there's statistics in there that helps, gives detail about how many students live in different areas. And that's something that, that segues into this uh, planning blocks. And you'll see on maps, and you'll see also on maps that are posted on the walls, there's a black and white dashed outlines around, a, it, within a school zone. So we look at, a, you say the, 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 every colored area is, represents an attendance area for a school. Within that area, there are these black and white dashed outlines that are divide each attendance area up into smaller pieces. Those are what we call planning blocks. And so if you look at those planning blocks, you'll notice there's a planning block ID number, and that's something that helps us. If you say a planning block, planning block uh, 603, we can kind of look, we, we can take note and be able to hone in exactly where you're talking about. Underneath that planning block ID number, represents the number of K through fifth graders that live inside that zone in that planning block that, uh, that um, attend their zone school. So, that, so, so you could see that some planning blocks uh, have smaller or larger numbers of students. We try to keep them concise, but when we develop these planning blocks, we try not to split communities. We try to keep communities intact to adhere to those, those considerations that I talked about with Rule 1280. But these are gonna be really informative for you it helps you guys, uh, empowers you with the ability to be able to look and move planning blocks one way or the other and know how many students you're moving and what the impact may be on the capacity of a school and things like that. So it'll be very helpful for you as you work, as you work through this study. We've got a live attend analysis and this is something that helps identify where students live and attend schools. 
So when you look at this, you'll see there's a green diagonal, and this represents the students that live in the zone and attend their zone school. But on the, along the top, these are the number of students that live in each zone. So if you look at each, any one of these numbers, it shows you how many students live in a zone. And then down on the, on the left, if you look down, these are the number of students who attend that school. And, um, and so when you start looking at it, you could see, if you look at it this way, say Elmwood has 527 that are enrolled there, 518 live in that zone and go to school there. But there's three students who um, attend Elmwood that, that live in the Fullerton zone. And so you can kind of track, I, I look, the green diagonal helps me see those are the ones that live in, a t go, live in the zone and go to school at that z zone school. All the other numbers are students that are attending from out of zone. Uh, and that just helps us kind of understand the mobility that exists in schools. And we, and we'll be account, as we estimate enrollment when we start getting into options, we'll be assuming similar rates of students to coming from out of zone to, to, because sometimes students attend from out of zone for programs or whatever the, whatever the, the reason may be and we, do, we don't want to um, overload a school and, not, and, and end up not having enough seats for students to come in from out of zone if that's the way, if there's something there that's, that, that, that draws students from out of their school zone. So this is something that you can use as a resource. You'll see that we're using 2019-20 data. Um, 2020 was just a strange year, and, and the enrollment numbers are hard to use for planning because of just the anomaly of what happened in 2020. So we're looking at 2019 at 20 because it's a more stable year. And then as we get closer into, into uh, the process, we, um, we may look at 2021. Uh, and, and determine if, if that's something that we want to do. Uh, but 2019-20 uh, but is a more stable and, and reliable year to use for planning, and that's why we're using that for this uh, process. So with uh, effective co collaboration, just some norms and ex expectations, and I know you guys are all adults, and you guys are all uh, good at working with, with groups and with communities and things like that. But we wanted to we want to set the stage or set the groundwork for some of the norms and ex expectations for collaborating and working as a group together. Um, we just ask that you be inclusive by allowing each member the adequate time and space to talk. Sometimes we'll ha you know we, we, these these processes can get contentious and emotions that emotional part starts to rise up. So just make sure that you're mindful and give give everybody the chance to say their words and allow for time between responses. Um, spend adequate time considering how each proposed change will impact uh, diverse stakeholders. Always be mindful of those considerations. As, as we move boundary lines, we're always going back to, are we, are we adhering to the rules and uh, boundary considerations as best as possible? Are we getting closer to adhe better adhering to those or are we getting further away? Um, if a conflict arises, be mindful of the tone and body language. Um, and uh, expect that there may be non-closure. So there's, when we work through these processes, there's always going to be something that gives you a little heartburn. Um, no plan is going to be perfect. And there's always going to be some parts of the plan that you wish you could make better, but you just there's too many students in an area, not enough seats, or there's roads, or walking areas, or there's different components that you have to factor in as we consider, continue to work through this. So I would expect that that's good, that may be the case here and that there are going to be uh, pros and cons or advantages and limitations of any option. So just be, be, expect that, no, that it's not going to be a perfect plan, but it's, it's something that you do the best you can. So before I get into our uh, exercises, does anybody have any questions? I, I know I, I talked for a good amount there, but does anybody have any questions or comments before we get into some uh, some activities yes ma'am and uh, the, if we have microphones posted on the uh, on the stands if you do have something to say if you could uh, step up to the mic and um, and then that way we're not passing a mic around good evening everyone 
I was wondering if, could you really um, go back and just re-explain the unmatched portion of um, page 22 of the slideshow, please? Sure, yes. Yes, and so with, as we, when we look at our students, we map out all the students based off of their home address. And so every student is mapped out based off of where they live. And um, as we go through that, there may be some, a small number of students that we could not locate their home address. So they may have a PO box address or uh, their address may not be found on our, on our mapping system. And so those we categorize as unmatched. We do include those in our numbers. Uh, we assume that they will stay at the school that they're enrolled to. If, there, if we could not find an address match, but we do try to match all students, uh, if at all possible. Any other questions or comments? So we have an exercise that we like to do, and this really helps get you guys working as a group and getting used to like uh, working together and collaborating, and this also really helps give us some good input and lets us understand how the community feels about certain components of, of this uh, boundary change study for this area. It's called a Strengths, Limitations, Opportunities, and Challenges. And it's a four-corner grid, and what we, we're asking you to do is we want you to brainstorm uh, these different components of the, of the grid and start looking through them and what are the strengths, limitations, opportunities, and challenges as it relates to the, uh, to the boundary study process and, and, and us, the, the work that we are doing as, as it relates to moving boundaries and, uh, and, and uh, uh, basically populating the new schools. So we, we guys are in your small groups and we're gonna ask that you stay, remain in, the, in, your, in your groups. And we just want you to go through and brainstorm the strengths, limitations, opportunities, and challenges as it relates to this bound to the to moving boundaries in this study area. And any component, it can be it, you'd really there are no right or wrong answers here. It's just really a brainstorming exercise. Uh, we're going to give you about 15 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes, depending on the pace of the groups, and to see how much time you need. And we have a flip chart at every station, and we're asking that that one person uh, help. Uh, record what's being said on the flip chart so we have a recorder um, and, a, um, and then we'll have somebody when we're all done and we're ready one of you will be asked to report out to the whole group so we'll hear what you have to say and 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 uh, so the whole committee can benefit from that there's also a parking lot attendant there may be some questions that are being asked that that aren't quite within the scope of our work so if th that happens just maybe put it on a little side sheet of paper and we'll note that and to follow up if it's a question that, that we can answer. We call that the parking lot. It's just something that, it's a question, that's, it's a good question, but it may not quite be pertinent for the elementary boundary change study that we're doing now, but we record those and follow up with those. Anybody have any questions about this? Okay, well uh, then we're gonna go ahead and let you guys, uh, let you guys get working and um, and yeah, you have your flip charts. We'll be going around the rooms, just sort of uh, seeing if you have any questions, and we'll let you guys get to get to work.
How about uh, f- how about five five minutes to wrap up uh, to wrap up your thoughts, and then we'll report out. Okay, I think we're gonna. Uh, <clears throat> I think we're gonna go ahead and regroup as a, as a full committee here. So, uh, who wants to? Who wants to go first? Which group wants to go first? Okay. All right. Okay, so we're gonna have this group. This group's gonna go first, and then we'll uh, we'll pick the n- next. Next person after. Good evening, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Yes? Yeah. Okay. So our group came up with, I'm just going to move this a little, the following. So we said for supportive strengths, present day are strong communities as well as school communities, uh, established outside partnerships. So that is, I know some schools have like churches that do different things and other community organizations. So that's a current present strength. Um, a students established routines as well as visions and missions. Current restrictive limitations. We said large class sizes for some of our schools that are obviously al- operating at over 100% capacity. Too, um, too few support staff. So for our students who are exceptional learners, we have different paraprofessionals as well as special education um, support staff and school-based support staff. So um, sometimes it's too few. Outdated buildings. Future opportunities. We said it could create more diversity and inclusion. It limits overcrowding. It also eliminates the satellite locations um, or satellite transports, Um, no more learning cottages. So for some of our schools, we have the temporary buildings, so that would eliminate that as well. New construction buildings. Also, it fixes some of our transportation issues. For some of us, I know at Vincent Farm, we have students who have homes that are built on the street, so we don't have sidewalks for them. So they have buses that come directly in front of their homes. So that eliminates that for potential future opportunities. Challenges though, 
could be the community's identification may change and shift. So for some of our communities, somebody brought up a great point in our group that it's like a legacy kind of thing. A lot of our students may have family members for generations that attended a school. So they want their like generations later to continue to go to that school. You may lose current students, obviously, which is also those broken relationships. Future overcrowding, I know that construction companies plan build outs, but you don't necessarily know what it's going to fully look like. And with new schools being built, you also have families that move to a newer school, so they'll move to a newer community. It, is, um, it could essentially establish trust, um, or establishing trust, excuse me, could be difficult. Rapport with new people, building that could be difficult. And last but not least, teacher movement. So how are we gonna make sure that our new students in new schools have the right teachers in those buildings as well as support staff? That's what we came up with. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, uh, who wants to go next? Okay, we'll go back here next and you guys will go last. Uh, we kind of drew arrows all over our chart too because some of the things that were limitations or challenges or also came as opportunities or strengths as well um, but for strengths we have putting communities back together so when we look at that map and we have those satellite areas that are very far apart um, from their communities um, we talked about um, better knowledge like this whole process is going to help us learn more about all of our schools um, our programs our communities and what they have to offer um, someone said using the outside services of your company because you are a pro and have been through this process before. You're the man, man. Um, <laughs> use, uh, better utilization of our, of our schools and our programs. Um, we talked about limitations, financial implications. Uh, somebody said, I don't have any map skills. I don't know how to do this as a limitation, but we also said that was an opportunity to grow. Uh, perceptions. Um, transportation, a challenge, an opportunity, a limitation, we're not really sure in the process. Um, opportunities, we talked about increasing diversity of staff and students. Um, perceptional change, so the impact on parking and facilities and bathrooms and things of that nature. Um, we talked about uh, an equity shift, and that's also an opportunity and a challenge. Um, we talked about challenges of emotion, challenges of lack of knowledge of all our schools that are participating in this program. Somebody mentioned, I don't even know if, what schools are Title I and what the impact would be on this boundary study mm -hmm. if they have regional programs and that impact as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then we talked about COVID and emotions. So we know that emotions are part of this, but we also said our families have been through so much over the last two years. And there's already emotions on the table of not being in school buildings for a year and a half and then possibly moving again in the near future. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, who wants to be the speaker for the uh, third group? Okay. Uh, good evening. Um, so, like similar to like what um, other groups uh, touched on, it's amazing to see that some of the things that are limitations and are, um, are our strengths can also be opportunities and challenges that we find, that they truly are intertwined. Um, so speaking about the, the strengths, um, let me make sure you hear me. So speaking of the strengths, transportation, that could be touched on, um, talks on with strengths, talks on touches uh, opportunities because we know, all of us know, <laughs> the challenges that sometimes can come with transportation. Um, we're limited on drivers in some cases, or even the drop off, the pick up and drop off line of your kid and how that can affect you. As um, someone mentioned, we were talking about if the new area doesn't have um, sidewalks, how can that impact the transportation and the moving about of our children? So that, those are some of the avenues we discussed. Um, relationships also goes into strengths because, um, we all become personally vested 
with our schools. And then now, if you have to move somewhere else, now you have to develop that relationship again with your community, with your principal, with the teachers there. We also discussed um, your sense of pride. We all, um, if you attend a school, again, going back to that personal relationship, you're personally vested. You have this pride, like, I'm a hawk. You know, my kid goes to Vincent Farm, so I'm, I'm I say that prideful. Um, your fifth graders, going back to that personal connection, um, if they're in fourth grade and then the next, their last year, they have to bid farewell at a new school, that can be challenging for a child. Um, we discussed in regards to limitations, overcrowdedness, the elephant in the room. Most of these schools are at over 100% capacity. So that is a huge limitation, So, which is also definitely an opportunity for us to be here to try to relieve some of that overcrowdedness. Um, we also discussed in regards to student ratios, which also goes back to the overcrowdedness, is because you know currently in some cases the teachers have way more students, but they're now opening the school, we can lower that ratio. And, and therefore impacting our children's education because they'll get more time with their educators. Um, in addition, you know, again, touching on opportunities with pride, having a sense of pride, and now you have to regain that pride, gain that relationship with the new school. Um, the, another challenge we have is, um, we mentioned about road, road congestion, because that also feeds into safety. Um, you know, we can't stress it enough, is in regards to there's not enough places for you to walk, is, um, as Latoya mentioned that if they're, you know, the school have to stop in front of, you know, the bus has to stop in front of someone's home and you gotta block off traffic, you know, safety is an issue. Um, and then finally, finally, um, is, you know, again, going, I can't stress it enough, it's about just the per, per, personal feeling, because as we know, it's been a colorful year for everyone, so now just, change in itself is just personal and can impact all of us kids and adults so those things nice. okay well thank you um so these are all really good comments as you can see there's some commonalities across the groups and some unique thoughts and things like that we'll put all of this into a summary document and we'll share this with you at the next meeting something you can refer to and we'll also uh our team and the staff will also study you know, the comments and, and see how that can help inform us. But this is really helpful to kind of see how the different things that we're tasked with and that, that we're facing. And it's, it's encouraging to see you guys all thinking, I could tell just by the comments and the, the, the quality of the exercise that you've done, that you're thinking holistically and thinking big picture. And that's really encouraging. Um, and so thank you for that. Um, so <clears throat> the next thing we wanted to do was give you a chance to look at planning blocks, okay? So this is your first, I know this is your first time seeing these, even learning about what a planning block is. So I'm not, we're not expecting you to be pros and giving us all kinds of constructive feedback on planning blocks, cutting them here and there. But what we want, what we want you to do is we want to give you a chance, give you a little bit of time to sort of review and discover the planning blocks, kind of look them over, see what you think, and really kind of if you see anything that's sort of uh, initial gut reaction that you will, what you look at, something that may need to be modified, if there's maybe a, a, subdiv a neighborhood that may be split in a planning block, or something like that, we're looking for that, just some initial feedback. These planning blocks are, are going to be able to be modified through the course of our study, and so we can always change them if we have to, but we're, um, we want to give you the opportunity to take a, take a close look and give you a little bit of time to study them and give us some initial feedback. Um, so in your background report, there is a map for each school and it has the planning blocks outlined on there. So uh, we're, what, we're, what we're thinking with, with social distancing and things is give you guys about five minutes, 10 minutes to look at the maps. You know, you could start with the map that you know your school first off and then kind of look at some of the other maps. You can also look at the plots because we have a plot map with planning blocks on them at each station. So you can go up and look at the big map, and uh, and has all the detailed road names on there too. Give you some time to look at them, and then when you're done, if you have any comments, maybe we can have one person from each group uh, mark up on the plot the the plot if there are any changes or anything that you see that kind of needs to be uh, flagged for further discussion or consideration. Okay. So you guys can work individually, uh, or you know, if you want to work with a partner, however you want to do it. Give you some time to kind of look through the maps, just kind of 
get your initial exploration of how they look, the planning blocks, and any feedback that you have, and then we'll, it could drive a change to the maps as we, uh, as we work for the next meeting.
Okay, uh, why don't we go ahead and uh, regroup as a, as a full committee here and um, just going around and hearing conversations, it's really, uh, it's a really positive thing to see the constructive thoughts and comments that are coming from the groups, just thinking about the opportunities that we have and starting to look at, you know, dissecting the maps and interpreting the maps. So I'm really proud of you guys really just diving into the data and looking at it. Um, I know that we had you guys do some individual stuff and things like that. So I think what I'll probably do is just look, just start with each small group and just from there see if there's any, any input and just go from group to group. So why don't we start with this group? I mean, did you guys have any Anything that you wanted to comment about the planning blocks or any changes or any, anything that you, uh, that you want to comment about the last 10 minutes, 15 minutes you took looking through the materials? Is there any, any input that you want to provide at this point? Could you, could you do the uh, microphone? I'm sorry. <laughs> For the public to uh, benefit. <laughs> Here you go. So we were discussing the two satellite locations, and we pretty much, if the two satellite locations, I think they, they go to McCormick now, but if that purple section, they kind of were, were brought up, we can kind of eliminate some of the, um, the students that goes to Elm, Elmwood mm -hmm. and they can kind of go to the new school and then the satellite location can kind of I don't know if I'm making sense but mm -hmm. I can probably point to it better so mm -hmm. but yeah we just thought about bringing them up and then separating them over there to go to the new school okay so you're already thinking constructively on ways to yeah, re unite the, yeah. to resolve those satellites and populate the new school and that's that's all good that's I've heard a lot of different people around the tables thinking about what would the new school zone look like and things like that and that's all really good really good thoughts to start building so anybody else uh, from this from this group that wants to provide any comments on regarding the planning blocks or the maps that we've uh, that you guys were studying okay uh, what about this group in the back any anybody want to provide any input uh, or any comments I see some. I see some uh, little uh, flip chart, a uh, little post-it notes up on that thing, that map back there. I put um, one post-it note up on there, um, just in regards to White Marsh. I noticed that White Marsh Road, um, the way the block is lined up, you can't really tell um, on there the houses on one side of it. Um, okay. How many students are included? I know for a fact that the number that they have listed is not correct because it has one and I, I live on there and I have three. So <laughs> <laughs> it was kind of easy for me to pick, pick, pick that one out. I was like, ah, eh, that might be wrong. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> yes, and a couple more to come. So yeah. um, just <laughs> might want to, uh, to see how that, how it actually lays out and who it fits sure. where, or whether it needs to be adjusted or not. Sure. If um, if maybe after the meeting, or you, you can give us a note of the planning block number that uh, or the planning block ID number, or you can write it on that the purple post-it. That's something we'll look into and follow up on. Yes, sir. Anybody else uh, provide any other comments or thoughts? For starters, you're going to have lots of chances to. To provide input still but um, okay what about this group anybody have anything that they wanted to uh, any input they want to provide there's a microphone right back there uh, I was speaking with some of the people at my table and we were noticing that the Perry Hall elementary school zone is very very dense and small because it's so densely populated and so that's an overcrowding issue which then becomes a domino effect because you don't want any satellites. So it really, when you look at that, if you pull from there, you have to move them to the next school over rather than to the new school because of the satellite issue and transportation. 
so it, it is a domino effect of how you spread out the students. So when you take from Perry Hall Elementary, then maybe they go to Joppa View, and then maybe those Joppa View students come to the new Northeast Elementary and so on, and it goes all the way down to the, the new Red House run. So it really is going to affect huge numbers of students, probably. And you bring up a great point with the, the domino effect, and that's something that we talk about every time we do this, and that sometimes you have to relieve a school, move students into this in the neighboring school, but then that neighboring school has too many kids now. Then you have to move kids out of that school into the next neighboring school, and you kind of end up doing a full circle to get them to kind of balance out. And that's sort of the domino effect, the cause and effect as it goes through. So, and, that's in, and it's encouraging that you, you know, seeing that and seeing some of the challenges that we have, with uh, balancing the utilization of the schools and things like that. Um, any, other, any other comments about the maps at, the, at this point? Yes, ma'am. I think that's where the mall, White Marsh Mall, is. Planning Block 433, you said? 133. But there are a lot of apartments and things back there now, over by the Sandpiper. So maybe it makes sense to split that block up to where the apartments are versus the other, uh, the mall and that area. Okay. And then for uh, 121, I noticed that it spans from Bel Air Road I just thought that was kind of wide. I didn't know if maybe it makes sense to split that, not necessarily in half, but where it makes sense among the neighborhoods because there's a difference in the neighborhoods there. So that was one. And then, um, kind of same thing for planning block 610 for um, maybe using Joppa Road as a border for that one. Okay. Same thing I think that the first gentleman has said about White Marsh. It's hard to tell where White Marsh Boulevard is, um, but there's also a lot of development as well going on on White Marsh Boulevard further down towards Eastern. And so I guess it's either 710 or 709. It might make sense to block that out as well and make it separate to account for that new building. Okay. But the townhomes and single family units that are there. Okay. See, it's not fair. She's, she's been in a prior study, so she's, she, this isn't her first rodeo. So she, she knows, she, she's, she's used to looking at planning blocks, so she's got a lot of constructive feedback. But sorry, I didn't mean to blow your cover there. But, um, but no, that's really good input. We'll take, definitely look at those planning blocks and, uh, and look and see if there's some adjustments that could be made. And like I said, um, it's not, this isn't the end time for you guys. You, there'll be opportunity as you continue to study the maps and go home and looking at things and whatever, uh, we can always make ad further adjustments. Um, does anybody have anything else that they want to do uh, comment on before we talk about next steps and let you guys go home tonight? Or any questions or anything like that? Well, this has been a, a really good, really good first meeting, guys. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, we do, we are meeting next week. So this is the only time we're a back-to-back -back meeting. So we're meeting next Wednesday at the same place here. After that, they're going to be every other week. And when we come back next week, we're going to be bringing you some draft options. We're going to actually, we created a few options or in the process of finalizing a few options just to get the conversation started for you guys to look at and react to. So... When we get to the next meeting next week, we'll have some things for you to look at and give us some feedback on options and really start diving into moving boundary lines. But um, other than that, that's all we have tonight. So we really appreciate your time and look forward to working with you guys in the next couple months, and we'll see you next week. Thanks a lot.